name is Dr. Melanie Korn, and I'm the president here at Columbus College of Art and Design. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight for this, uh, what is bound to be a fantastic event. I'm excited to kick off our new series, but first I want to tell you about a few upcoming events here at CCAD. Most immediately, uh, this is actually sort of a kickoff, it's serving two purposes, so it's a kickoff to the Columbus International Film and Animation Festival, which is happening beginning tomorrow through Saturday, both here and at the Drexel. So you can check out world-class feature-length films and documentaries, shorts, and a lot of new animated work as well. This is moving on a timer, which I don't want it to. Do you want your work to move on a timer? No, okay, let's stop that now then before we get into that. Sorry, one moment. Use timings, no. Okay, shout if this starts scrolling again without me touching anything. Okay, and uh, next month, the MFA exhibition Collision will open on Friday, April 6th. Uh, and then you might as well just pitch a tent uh, on the quad because on the following morning, Saturday, April 7th, you'll want to join us for the CCAD Art Fair where you can buy artwork and support CCAD students and alumni, artists, and designers. Then in May, of course, we come to our end of year exhibition and celebrations. Chroma, Best of CCAD, takes over campus on Wednesday, May 9th. This major exhibition and happening showcases the best student work at CCAD, and it's free and open to the public, so hopefully you'll all come back. And the 2018 CCAD Fashion Show is coming up on Friday, May 11th. This year, it'll be at the Greater Columbus Convention Center, and it gives you a chance to see the top work from emerging student designers. Tickets are still on sale. And of course, there's more information about all of these events right outside and online at ccad.edu slash calendar. Now, back to tonight. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our new series, Art Design, in the Art Design Values. CCAD launched a new strategic plan in 2017, and part of that plan was to redefine our institutional core values. After a collaborative pro process, we landed on inspiration, respect, positivity, and accountability. So we developed a series of four events in 2018 so that we could share these values beyond our internal community uh, and share them more broadly in a, in a public venue. So each of these four events will highlight one of our four values. And we did that because at CCAD, students aren't just learning to become artists and designers, they're learning the values that will help them become informed, creative citizens when they graduate. So, for respect, we'll be hosting a higher education student affairs conference here in May. For positivity, we'll have poet Sarah Abu Rashid speak at our new student convocation on August 27th. And for accountability, we'll have author of How to Raise an Adult and Real American, Julie Lithcott Hames on September 20th. I would encourage you all to save the date for this last one and attend what will surely be another outstanding talk. Finally, tonight, I'm thrilled to introduce Bree Newsom, who will be our speaker on inspiration. Bree is a contemporary civil rights icon who first garnered national attention for her daring act of peaceful disobedience in June 2015. Following the brutal murder of nine black parishioners at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, Bree climbed the flagpole at the South Carolina State House and pulled down the Confederate flag as a protest against racist symbolism. Her arrest galvanized public opinion and led to the permanent removal of the flag. As a recognized and celebrated voice on the topics of injustice and racial discrimination, Bree brings to light the importance of leadership development in building and sustaining social movements. But not only is Bree a human rights activist, she is also an accomplished filmmaker and musician, writing her first piece of music at age seven and her first play at age nine. <laughs> she studied film in New York University's Tisch School for the Arts, I'm sure not long after that. And in her senior, for her senior year short film, Wake, uh, she won numerous accolades and was a finalist for the prestigious Wasserman Award. As Bree's bio points out, her dedication to community work has not lessened her interest in either film or music and she often interweaves the two. This is why I am so pleased that Brie accepted our invitation to come share her experiences with the CCAD and Columbus community. 
For me, she embodies how art is more than a mere reflection of the society is, I hope, while, why we're all here. Now please join me in welcoming Bree Newsom. for having me. It's been a warm reception despite the cold weather. <laughs> um, got to have great lunch with a couple of faculty. That was really wonderful. Had a wonderful visit with the documentary class and they asked some great questions. So I hope that y'all will ask some great questions as well. Um, it's actually really funny and ironic to me that I'm here in this position speaking with you about uh, not just art and activism and, and inspiration in a general way, but kind of pulling from my own personal life because that is honestly something I had not seen myself doing. Um, there was a point not long ago in the summer of 2013, I have a photo up here, this is, <laughs> this is not a recreation, this is an actual photo um, from me sitting on the beach in South Carolina in 2013. I had a moment where I kind of determined to myself that I didn't want to be a political artist. I didn't want to be a political artist. And by that I meant I didn't, I didn't necessarily want politics to be um, a central focus of my art and the things that um, I would create. Just a couple weeks later, I would end up being arrested in a protest over voting rights. So you see about how long that uh, thought lasted with me. But, um, but in terms of like, you know, when I, when the whole time that I was growing up, I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be an artist. That was something that I that I that I did know about, and I did have you know somewhat of a socio-political consciousness and, and awareness when I was growing up, but never would have uh, you know foreseen being an activist, and certainly would have never foreseen putting myself in a position to be arrested, um, and, and certainly not in the way that I did it in 2015 in terms of scaling the the flagpole in South Carolina. Um, when I look back on it now in retrospect, though, I think that the seeds of it were always there. Um, one of my first projects, uh, it was mentioned in the bio that I started writing uh, music at the age of seven, uh, but one of the first creative projects that I did, I was actually in the fifth grade, I wrote a play about Martin Luther King. And I did that in response to um, the fact that there was a play being put on um, by the school, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. And there were no students of color that were cast in the play. And so I wanted to create a play that we could cast ourselves in, and then of course centering it around um, Martin Luther King Jr. I remember, you know, when there was no Disney, Black like Disney Princess. Um, at the time that I was growing up, there, there was no such thing as a Disney, Black Disney Princess, and so I created my own. Her name was like Akili. Um, she was an African warrior princess from ancient Nubia, and I wrote my own screenplay. I would, you know, draw images of her, and that was how I created um, an image for myself that did not exist yet in the media. Um, when I was a senior in high school, uh, I did a short film called The Three Princes of Idea, and that was a short animated film um, looking at religious tensions between Christianity, Judaism, um, and Islam. In my freshman year of college, I did a short film about encouraging the youth voter turnout as part of the Rock the Vote, they had a Rock the Vote uh, film, camp, uh, film competition. And I made a short PSA encouraging uh, youth voter turnout. Um, and even my short film, Wake, um, that I did sometime later, uh, my, my senior year of uh, college at NYU, in retrospect, that was also political in some ways. This was um, the, the last film I, that I was making at NYU. I didn't know how long it was going to be before I got a chance to make another film. And I wanted to tell a story that reflected uh, my background in, in um, Eastern North Carolina. But at that point in time, in, in 2013, I had, uh, my short film had been on the film festival circuit for some time. I ended up getting an invitation to be artist in residence at Saatchi and Saatchi ad agency in New York City. And after returning from, from that stint as an artist in residence, coming back to North Carolina and thinking about it, I knew that I didn't want to go into advertising. I knew that that wasn't um, the path for me. And I wasn't really sure that I wanted to be, um, again, a, a political artist in, in that sense. The, the last project that I did before leaving New York when I was artist in residence at Sachi and Sachi was a music video parodying the Mitt Romney campaign. I don't know if y'all remember that in 
2012. That was, for some reason, there was like this brief period of time where everybody's making these rap videos about Mitt Romney. I thought it was a more creative thing at the time that I did it than it ended up being. Um, but it still ended up making its own unique impact, and I thought it was important to say at that time because I just felt like that campaign was really trying to tap into a lot of homophobia and racism and all of the things that you know we see at the forefront now, but of course have been you know rising to the to the top for some time. But I, I felt in a lot of ways, honestly, that it kind of took me to a negative space dealing in that. And so reflecting on that, that was why I said to myself that I didn't necessarily want to be a political artist. I didn't want that to be um, the focus of what I was doing. There were a couple things that happened that shifted my thinking around that somewhat, or I would say kind of set me on the path towards shifting my thinking around that, leading me to where I am today, where I really see the two as inseparable in terms of my um, identity. And it was, as I said, not long after, you know, me sitting on the beach saying I don't want to be a political um, activist, that a few things happened uh, in that summer of 2013. There was a um, massive attack on voting rights in the state of North Carolina where I lived. The US Supreme Court struck down key parts of the Voting Rights Act that year in 2013 and allowed um, states in the South to make changes to their election laws without advanced federal approval. Well, North Carolina um, wasted no time they first introduced House Bill 589 as this five-page bill that basically said uh, students can no longer use their IDs to vote. And that in and of itself, of course, was um, a controversy because, you know, for years students have been using their IDs to vote. You had, you know, students at UNC Chapel Hill using state-issued ID, and now the state is saying that the issue, the, the um, ID that the state has issued is no longer valuable, or is no longer valid to vote. That was problematic in and of itself. But then what happened overnight between um, Monday and Tuesday, I went to a Moral Monday protest. For those who are not familiar, this was um, a series of protests organized by the NAACP, the North Carolina State Chapter of the NAACP, and every Monday they would march to the Capitol in Raleigh and lift up a different issue. Well, I went to a protest on voting rights in July. Literally overnight between that Monday and that Tuesday, the bill went from the House to the Senate and they added 50 more pages to this bill that included measures more explicitly targeting um, black voters. Well, what was part of what was happening at that time, um, there were several other states who were you know, making similar initiatives, taking similar efforts. Um, the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney General had already sued the state of Texas, but North Carolina was by and large kind of uh, flying under the radar. Um, North Carolina has been in the news and you know more recent times people are aware like HB2 and some of these other controversial measures where people are aware of the turmoil that's going on in North Carolina but at that time North Carolina was still seen in many ways as the more progressive state of the South um, and so people weren't really paying attention to what was happening in North Carolina and so we felt that it was um, very important to stage a sit-in that next day, on Wednesday, we staged the sit and you can see me um, in the upper right-hand corner where I'm talking to the news cameras. Um, I joined with other activists in staging a sit-in at the speaker's office, and we basically demanded that he meet with us or we you know, would refuse to leave the office. Now, of course, we knew there's a very little likelihood that he was going to um, meet with us, but it was about using the power of the media. It was about using communication in a moment where there was um, an urgent issue happening that what we were you know, very concerned was going to be overlooked by many of the people um, in, in the state. And so we dramatized um, that whole situation by you know, staging um, the sit-in and, and using the media. Even though I was still using my skills as a communicator and my background in that situation, I'm still operating with the idea that I'm not a political artist, right? I, I, I was saying to myself, okay, this is a moment of urgency. We have the attack on voting rights going on. This is also the same summer that the Trayvon Martin case was, was happening. So at the same time that we're doing a sit-in protest in North Carolina, the Dream Defenders uh, youth-led group down in Florida was also staging an occupation of um, the Florida State House in response to the Trayvon Martin case. So even while all of these things are going on and I'm, I'm aware that I am using my communication skills in that moment, I'm still seeing it as separate from my role as an artist. My response was that this, this is a moment of urgency. And so I, I don't have time to pursue uh, a, a career in arts. I don't have time to chase after you know, a, a profession in entertainment because of what's happening on the ground. Um, 
I wanted to figure out a way to serve a greater purpose as well um, in terms of what I was doing. Um, up until now, I, I felt that I had operated primarily on personal ambition in terms of you know what I wanted to be as a filmmaker and what I wanted to be as an artist. Um, was had been primarily more about my personal expression and my personal response um, to what was going on. But now I saw myself as taking my skills and really using it more towards movement building. Um, over here on the left, this shirt, People Over Money, that was a shirt that I designed. That was um, really at the beginning of kind of like the statement tees. So people started making the activist statement tees. Um, that has been um, particularly prominent in the movement in North Carolina. You can see over on the right hand side, you see somebody in the background. Um, wearing the shirt there. I would design um, flyers for you know events. I did logos for organizations. I was um, doing you know media talking points for protests. I was just taking all the skills that I had and pouring it in this way, but still seeing myself as uh, you know stepping away from my artistic pursuits. Um, of course, the Confederate flag removal is the action that I am most recognized for. Um, I wanted, before I, I, I talk specifically about that particular action as a form of performance art and, and all the thought that went into that and why, I want to first give background because I don't want to assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about or knows the history of South Carolina and this um, particular flag. So let me just briefly give you some background on that. So the Confederate flag, of course, um, this flag wouldn't exist but for the fact that the Confederacy uh, was formed. Um, but for the fact that the southern states seceded from the Union for the purpose of maintaining the institution of slavery. In fact, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union, arguing that, quote, we of the South contend that slavery is right. And I just want to read for you briefly um, the quote on the left. This is from William T. Thompson, who was the co-designer of the second national flag of the Confederacy or the Confederate battle flag. And he's quoted as saying, as a people, we are fighting to maintain the heaven-ordained supremacy of the white man over the inferior or colored race. On the right side, you have Alexander Stevens, who is the vice president of the Confederacy, and he's quoted as saying, the Confederacy's foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. Of course, the South lost the war, fortunately. The Confederacy lost the war. Um, but the Confederate flag reemerged um, following Reconstruction and during the rise of Jim Crow. The Confederate flag uh, really reemerged as a symbol of anti civil rights. Um, and that is what it has represented from that, that, uh, that time since, really. Um, the state of South Carolina raised the Confederate flag originally over the dome of its capital in 1961 as a statement of anti-civil rights and opposition to um, effort or pressure from the federal government to desegregate. Um, they said at the time that they were raising it to mark the 100th anniversary of the start of the war, but given that the war started in 1860, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, what was happening in 1961 was that was really the height of sit-in protests, including um, the Rock Hill Nine, or also known as the Friendship Nine, and that was a, a pivotal turning point in the sit-in movement throughout the South, but particularly in South Carolina. And what made that a turning point was that these activists, when they were arrested, they um, refused bail. And that was a major tactical shift because part of what was happening uh, within the movement at that time was people were running out of bail money and how can, you know, how can we keep this going? So when the Friendship Nine refused bail, that was really, um, that was you know, really stirring and shocking for the power establishment and it was at that time that South Carolina raised the Confederate flag over its dome. Well, it was always a point of controversy um, from the time that it was raised. Some people are under the assumption that the Confederate flag in South Carolina only became a point of controversy after the shootings in Charleston, but it was always controversial. I, my um, mom's family is from South Carolina. I would go down to South Carolina all the time, always see that flag. We always knew what it represented and what it meant. Um, in the year 2000, South Carolina agreed to move the flag from the dome of the Capitol, where it originally was, to the lawn. Um, at that time, they wrote into the law that the flag could not be lowered for any reason unless there was a two-thirds approval from the State House. They also built a four-foot-tall spoked fence 
around the flag. Um, and it created an internal pulley system so nobody could go up and simply cut the cord. Like they had to put layers and layers of protection because there was always um, this threat and it was always such a point of controversy. The NAACP continued to call for boycotts of the state. The NCAA refused to host uh, championship games there. And that's where the situation was um, when in 2015 a white supremacist named Dylan Roof went into Mother Emanuel AME Church, um, historically black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and shot and killed uh, nine black parishioners during a prayer meeting. Well, naturally, once photos surfaced of um, Dylan Roof waving this Confederate flag or holding this Confederate flag, it refocused attention on the flag there at um, the Capitol. And part of what made it so egregious, uh, just in the visuals of it all, was that the pastor of Mother Emanuel AME uh, was Clementa Pinckney. And in addition to being the pastor at the church, he was also a state representative. Just days before being assassinated in his own church, he had succeeded in getting body camera legislation passed, mandating that officers in North Charleston would have to wear police body cameras. And that was in response to the Walter Scott case. Are you familiar with the Walter Scott case? This is a very famous case in um, North Charleston. Walter Scott was um, a passerby, just happened to be going by with cell phone video, and caught um, former officer Michael Slager shooting and killing Walter Scott in the back while he was running away. Walter Scott was a black man. Um, and so just days after passing that legislation, Clementa Pinckney is assassinated in his church. Well, because he's a state representative, they you know, gave him a formal um, viewing in the rotunda. They paraded his casket through the streets of Columbia. And as they're doing that, because of the law they passed in 2000, the United States flag was at half staff, the state flag of South Carolina was at half staff, but the Confederate flag was still up high because they had written into the law that it required two thirds to lower it for any reason. So that's the background, just giving you the, the setting. So I had actually had a previous conversation with a fellow activist friend of mine who was from South Carolina, and this, there was no serious concrete plans around it, but we just said to each other, like, you know, if an opportunity came to take that flag down, We'll do that, like we'll, we'll go back to jail for that. That was something that we had agreed on. Once the massacre happened, it, it became a more concrete thing. Like we were like, yes, we're, we're serious. We're, we're really gonna do that. The first practical consideration was simply how could we do it? Um, for all the reasons that I, that I just mentioned, they had built this spoked fence around it. You couldn't simply knock the pole over. You couldn't simply go up and um, cut the cord down. So we really weren't sure. We were trying to figure out, is there somebody we know in the city with a cherry picker? We were just trying to figure out all the different um, possible ways to uh, take it down. My friend ended up knowing someone else who actually went down to the state house grounds looked at the poll and figured that somebody could probably scale to the top. He knew um, Greenpeace activists, environmentalist activists who had background scaling trees and things like that. And he had uh, made the assumption that that technique could probably be applied to taking the, the flag down. So that's how we got to our method. Um, we came together, it was a Saturday when we took the flag down. It was the Tuesday before um, that we came together to meet about it. And you know, once deciding like, yes, we were, we were gonna do this, we were gonna go through with this, the first practical consideration was who could scale to the top? Who could scale to the top, who was physically able um, to do it, and who could risk being arrested? Because we knew that there was a, you know, pretty much a 100% chance that whoever did this um, would likely be arrested. That narrowed it down to about three of us. Um, of those three, um, I was the only person of color. We were all women, I was the only person of color. Of course, I have a, a personal connection to South Carolina. Uh, my ancestors are from South Carolina. They were enslaved in South Carolina. Um, I've been to, the, to their graves where they still rest, are laid to rest not far from the plantation where they were enslaved. And then, then of course, we recognize the powerful image of a black woman taking down the flag in South Carolina. And that's where we started to think through more strategically, what did we want to communicate visually with this action? And um, really, we are attacking a symbol of slavery and segregation and hatred and violence. And through the process of taking it down, we want to create a new image of liberation, of racial solidarity, of peace, of civil disobedience, um, of defying fear, all of that. 
Um, and so that's when we made the decision that James Tyson, who was on the right here, that he should stand guard at the bottom and be arrested alongside with me in a show of racial solidarity. Um, first of all, just from, a per just from a performance art aspect, what we wanted to communicate visually was here's a black woman scaling to the top, dismantling racism, and here's her white accomplice at the bottom helping her um, take it down together, right? Um, but also there were practical considerations um, in that decision that we made. We recognized that James, as a white man uh, disguised as a construction worker, was likely to buy us more time. Because when somebody glanced over and they, oh, there's a white man there, it's, it's nothing to worry about, <laughs> right? But that's a very real thing. And then when I neared the top and prepared to take the flag down, the officers actually threatened to tase me. And I'm attached to a metal pole, so there's a good chance that I could have been electrocuted had they done that. And James grabbed the pole and said, you know, if you electrocute her, you'll have to electrocute me too. And then they backed away. So it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't just symbolic in terms of his presence there, but actually helped de-escalate um, the situation. The process of me scaling the pole itself, you know, like I said, that was initially just a practical matter of how we could get it down. But in terms of performance and thinking through like how are we how, how are we using that as a symbol, that that was part of what ended up making the action itself so impactful. Was was just how my climb itself kind of symbolized this prolonged um, this prolonged physical struggle uh, um, to take the flag down. I made a conscious decision to dress in all black, right? Um, all black, very much associated with black power movement. Um, we thought through, you know, should we replace the flag with another flag? We were like, is, should we replace it with the Pan African flag? Should we create a new flag that symbolizes something else? We decided against that because we didn't want to make it about a, a competition between flags. We wanted to keep it focused on the simple issue of taking the flag down. South Carolina saying, yes, we acknowledge that this is horrible, that morally the flag should come down, but the unjust law that was passed when black people can't vote. That's why we can't um, lower the flag, right? And so by doing this action, we were forcing the state of South Carolina into a moral crisis of having to decide whether to leave the flag down, which they said was the right, they said was the right thing to do, right? Or to raise it back up. And of course, in the immediate aftermath, they raised the flag back up, but a few days later, um, lowered the flag. All in all, um, I, I mean, I would say the action achieved what we were aiming to achieve, not only in, in simply getting the flag down, but also in terms of creating this new image. And you, um, after seeing the photographs and the video, um, many different artists created different depictions that basically um, brought to life what the, what the moment symbolized. Like, obviously, I wasn't sitting on top of the pole. That would have been pretty awesome if I was like crouched on top of the pole like Catwoman with my arms up and no gear and no helmet and no fear. Um, but what was really awesome about the, the um, illustrations that came was how they, they took what was documented, right, and then captured the spirit of the moment and everything um, that it symbolized. And of course, again, when we're talking about um, not only Confederate flags, but these Confederate statues, um, that's a large part of what the conversation is, not simply what are we removing, but what is the conversation that we're having around what we're removing? What is the education that we're having around um, why these statues and symbols were put in place? Because there's an ideology that's reflected, right? Um, it's, it's not simply um, a, a work of craftsmanship. It's not simply the work of a metal worker. There's an ideology that's behind it. There's, a, there's an ideology behind putting a Confederate monument in front of a Southern state house in front of a southern courthouse. Um, and so much of the conversation that's happening now is not simply about taking the statues down, but what are we replacing it with? Are we, are we building a new statue that represents the way forward? Are we simply um, leaving it empty? And so I love that this whole conversation has been sparked as a result of the deliberate um, nature and all of the forethought that we put into the action. So on one hand, yes, the action is um, classic civil disobedience, right? In a lot of ways, the state of South Carolina is saying um, you cannot lower the flag because of this law that we passed, which we would argue is an unjust law because at the time that the flag was raised, black South Carolinians who were like the majority of the population couldn't even participate in voting. Um, so it's, it's, it's classic civil disobedience, but it's also performance art. And to a certain extent, um, some of the most powerful uh, demonstrations 
have a bit of performance in them. I was just speaking with a documentary, uh, documentary class earlier about this. Um, now, I wouldn't describe much, many of the things that Martin Luther King did as performance art necessarily, right? But there was a performance consciousness in terms of everything that he was doing, the decisions um, that they would make in terms of where they would have mass protest. Um, they tended to choose the sheriffs that they knew would show up with hoses because that would help dramatize um, the situation. Making use of this um, medium called television that is suddenly in homes across the nation and, and how do you use that as a tool to communicate what you are trying to, com to communicate, communicate, excuse me. Um, and of course my background in communications also came in handy when we had to fight the dominant narrative, which is something that um, we do all the time. It, it does, it's not simply in uh, that one action that we were able to accomplish everything um, that we accomplished. It was also um, engaging with the media, being very clear about the message that we wanted to communicate in the aftermath. I still travel the nation and talk about this issue, and that is an extension of the flag action. So people see the visual, which is very powerful. But then there has to be the follow-up education. There has to be the conversation where we're talking more about uh, what this is, why did I risk my life that day um, to take down a flag? Because it was never just about a flag, right? Um, it's about these symbols. So I want to talk some about art as power and just the, the, the sheer power of art. Um, part of why art is so powerful is because of its ability to give us perspective, right? There are as many perspectives in the world as there are people. Right? We are all seeing the world through our own lenses. There are millions of events happening every single day. How do we make sense of it all? Well, there's the newsreel, which kind of gives you the facts and the rundown of what's happening. But art has a unique way of taking the world that is around us and really, tr really translating it um, in, a certain, in a way that helps us make sense of it and interpret it. Now, that can happen in both positive and negative ways, right? And that's why, I'm sure some of you saw this, and you're like, where are you going with this? Why did you go from talking about taking down the Confederate flag to putting Birth of a Nation up here? Um, well, Birth of a birth, the Birth of a Nation, excuse me, by D.W. Griffith, this was actually the first Hollywood blockbuster. Did you know that? This is the first Hollywood blockbuster film was a pro-KKK film. Um, and was basically built around the fears of you know, emancipated African Americans running wild, taking over the legislatures in the South. I mean, the same ideology that inspired South Carolina to raise the Confederate flag over its dome. But this was an extremely powerful film at the time that it came out. The President of the United States actually held private screening at the White House for this film. Um, the NAACP led massive boycotts of this film. Um, this film is still banned in a lot of areas uh, because of its power. It's still also actively used as a recruitment tool. Um, for the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacist groups. Um, another example is Triumph of the Will. Um, this is a, a photo from outside the premiere of Triumph of the Will in 1936, was it 35? Let me double check the date real quick because I don't want to tell you wrong. 1935, yes. So this is, out, this is um, the premiere of Triumph of the Will in Berlin in 1935. For those of you who are not familiar, this is a film by Lenny Riefenstahl, which was really part of the whole mythologizing um, of the Nazis. I'm not gonna show a clip here because I'm also not a fan of this film. Um, but it's important, it, it's important to be aware of, like if you, if you see the film, you will see the way that Hitler is filmed in such heroic angles and just all of the thought that went into um, the, the type of lens. I, I, don't mean, I don't mean lens in terms of the physical lens, but in terms of the viewpoint. Um, that was used to portray the Nazis in a certain way. Extremely powerful film. Um, really was uh, very instrumental in the ability of the Nazis to spread their ideology and, and uh, have more influence in Europe. Um, this film also banned uh, in, in many places. Um, can you imagine like walking down Berlin and seeing <laughs> a huge Nazi eagle like that today? But that's the equivalent of what we have throughout the South because we never took our monuments down. Um, let me show you something more positive on a positive note, <laughs> positive side of it. Um, the movie Philadelphia. Um, I was talking with the documentary class earlier and I was saying how I do a lot of work uh, you know, outside of the Confederate flag removal. That's obviously what I'm most known for, but I do a whole lot of work um, outside of that, that you know, news cameras don't show up for it. <laughs> it's not sexy, it's not flashy, you know, it's knocking on doors, it's organizing community meetings, it's, it's all these kinds of things. Um, but it's just as important and impactful and powerful 
as what I, and as necessary as demonstrations like removing the Confederate flag. Um, and so I say it's a both and, but what that says to me, the fact that the kind of like on the ground organizing, or I would say the fact that a powerful, single powerful demonstration can have mobilizing power to the extent as organizing on the ground says so something that about how powerful the visual image is, right? And the power of art. So in the case of, of Philadelphia, if you're not familiar with this film, I think this came out in 1990. In this story, Tom Hanks plays a, a gay attorney who has AIDS and he's fired. He's like a top player, a really great attorney. He ends up being fired by his law firm uh, for reasons that don't seem clear and he suspects that it's because he has AIDS and Denzel Washington plays the attorney who is defending him. Now, what, the reason that I'm putting this up here as an example is that the um, AIDS awareness movement had been going on for a long time before this film came out. Um, and there was a great struggle to really help people understand the AIDS epidemic, um, to really remove the stigma around AIDS. Um, and though people had been organizing around it for a long time, the film Philadelphia was a very pivotal point in terms of changing people's minds, in terms of getting them to really understand what the AIDS epidemic looked like, putting a face on it, being able to empathize with a character like Tom Hanks made them uh, better able to empathize with others. Um, Guernica, I will never forget the first time that I saw this painting by Paolo Picasso. I was in um, Spanish class and, I, and it, it just had such an impact on me, just the visual of it. And I imagine that that's how it is for many people the first time they encounter this painting. And I imagine that's how it was in 1937 um, when this painting first premiered and why it has the longevity that it does. Um, this painting, Guernica, Pablo Picasso painted this in response to um, the Nazi and um, Italian fascist bombing of uh, Guernica, a, ta a town in Basque. Um, this painting, uh, this mural, really, it's a very large mural, um, toured and was very um, instrumental in raising awareness around the Spanish Civil War and mobilizing in that way. Um, of course, civil rights, uh, the, the music of the um, civil rights movement um, demonstrates how art has a power to um, not only in, inspire, but also mobilize. I mean, the, the civil rights protest songs of the 60s, um, you, you'll hear activists talk about like how being incarcerated in, in jail, and they would sing to each other as a way to stay motivated. Um, they would be singing to each other when they were being you know, carted off um, um, to the jail. This song is still enduring today, uh, We Shall Overcome. Um, Vietnam, uh, and, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you like different examples, right? So I would consider documentation and photography to definitely be a, a part of this. I'm not just talking about creative art, I'm not simply talking about things that you create from scratch, but also the power of the lens, right? Um, and there's really no such thing as an objective lens. People say that, but there's really, even if you make a decision to just shoot a wide angle, wide angle and capture everything, that's not an objective um, lens, but, but the power of um, being conscious of what you're capturing and, and how you're capturing it. Um, the war photography of Vietnam was hugely instrumental in terms of um, impacting opinion about that war in the US and people just getting tired of the violence and the violence seeming senseless. Um, the powerful nature of art often results in artists being involved in major political movements and sometimes becoming uh, targets of, of uh, political powers or kind of being caught in the political crosshairs. Um, the Black Arts Movement from 1965 to 1975 is a perfect example. These were, uh, they called themselves cultural nationalists, and they were intentional in terms of responding to a moment. So this is following the um, assassination of Malcolm X, and there was a collective of, well, not just one collective, it was really several collectives who, who formed this movement, but they made a conscious decision to create art that was culturally relevant for black people um, and, and for the time, um, theater and um, writing and poetry and music and everything that really expressed a black cultural pride. Um, they created their own uh, publishing houses, which is also, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit more in just a second, but um, in terms of having access 
to distribution, having access to printing. I mean, it's not simply uh, uh, an, an issue of being able to create, but it's just like, how do you distribute? How do you reach an audience? Even that itself is a political thing. And so creating um, the publishing houses, black owned publishing houses, so they could publish things that predominantly white publishing houses were um, refusing to publish. This movement also led to the creation of many African American studies programs at major universities. Um, Another example, the uh, Parents Music Resource Center and the Parental Advisory Label. Um, this was an effort that began in the mid-1980s to mixed results, questionable results. Um, but um, a group of adults, you know, kind of responding to primarily at that time rock music, hip hop ended up kind of becoming the greater focus as it moved into the 90s. They were demanding that uh, certain content be labeled as explicit. And their, their goal in that was to limit the access uh, that children had to it. But of course, what happened was children, you know, saw that label like, that's what I want. I want the one that has the explicit content on it. I want what my parents are trying to keep from me. Um, and so that's kind of, um, you know, how that went. But, but I mean, for a lot of artists, it, it still kind of put them in the crosshairs. And of course, one of the great um, um, hypocrisies in many ways that gangster rappers were pointing out, for instance, is like, you know, you're policing us for talking about violence, but who's who's policing the government for actually inflicting violence, you know? Um, so that's still an ongoing thing. Of course, pop culture artists frequently um, find themselves in, in, in the crosshairs, and this is not simply because of who they are as figures, but just the fact of the matter that um, the government and the entertainment industry are two of the most powerful kind of institutions within our country. And so a lot of times you'll see them interacting with each other in strange ways, like our reality show president. Um, but then you'll also see them at odds with each other. Um, oftentimes, of course, Kanye West's famous statement about you know George W. Bush not caring about uh, black people. Um, the Dixie Chicks also came under fire during the, the Bush administration. There was a, a, an era, a period of like heavy censorship any, against anybody who tried to speak out against the war. Um, Beyonce just recently came under controversy for um, kind of evoking imagery of the Panthers at a, a recent um, Super Bowl. And this kind of brings me to my next point, which is that there is no such thing as apolitical art. And I'm saying this like, it's probably not a revelation to y'all, but it was a revelation to me at the time, you know, when I realized how foolish it was for me to say I want to be an apolitical artist. Um, I came to realize that there, there really is no such thing as apolitical art. Um, art will always exist within a certain cultural, historical, social, and economic circumstance. Um, hip hop grew out of a very uh, specific set of historical, social, and economic um, circumstances. First of all, you have black people who are descended from those who have been driven out of the South by terrorism, um, relocated to uh, you know, urban centers in the North and the Bronx, for instance, living in very kind of heavily congested um, conditions. And so it makes sense that in that circumstance, the turntable becomes a new instrument, right? If we don't have a whole lot of space, uh, we may not have access to a whole lot of instruments, the turntable and the records become a new type of instrument and a new type um, of music. Um, using the, the, the beatbox, the vocals, the body, um, tapes, a limited amount of space, um, hip hop really arose from, from house parties and street parties. Um, and no matter what iteration it might take today, it cannot be stripped from its um, historical and political um, context. Disco. I'm a disco fan, I'm gonna let you know. I love Donna Summers. Um, I think disco is really underrated in a lot of ways. Um, and the more that I learn about it, the more I think it's kind of an injustice because I think a lot of the blowback to disco was really um, just blowback against queer people of color. Um, but disco itself also rose out of a certain uh, um, historical and political and social moment. Um, disco was in many ways a reaction to, um, you know, the, the kind of protest music of the 60s, this kind of like anti-dance atmosphere, and disco was kind of like, no, we want to dance, like we want to have fun, we don't want to talk about all that stuff, this is the 80s, there's cocaine, we want to dance. Um, and, and so that's uh, kind of what it was born out of. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there was also a very kind of violent blowback against um, disco. And, and many people at the time, and I would agree with that analysis as well, feel that it really was a pushback against the gay culture um, that disco really kind of arose out of. Disco started to kind of go mainstream, but it, you know, you can't deny the roots of the thing. And, and I think a lot of the pushback was against that. Um, the recent Obama portraits, I'll use that as 
uh, my last example here. Um, political. <laughs> First of all, any portrait of uh, uh, you know, a, a political figure, a ruler of any kind is, is political. It's not like the, the presidential portraits only got political when the Obamas got painted, right? But their decisions in who they chose to do the portraits and how the portraits were done was also inherently political. Uh, Michelle Obama's portrait was done by a woman named Amy Sherrill, and a lot of her work kind of centers on exploring how people perform identity, right? How do people perform identity relative to how society expects them to perform it? To perform it, and so here she's taking Michelle Obama. First of all, both of these artists are black, and they're the first black artists to paint presidential portraits. Um, so here she's taking um, Michelle Obama and imagining her in, you know, in, in this other context that is very unlike most traditional portraits that we see of first ladies. Same with Barack Obama, surrounded by flowers, very different type of portrait than we are, are used to seeing. This one was done by Kehinde Wiley, and a lot of his work as well kind of looks at representation. Um, much of his work takes African-American men, like modern African-American men, and puts them in historical poses, typically associated with like, you know, older, more traditional paintings, which is um, very interesting. It was also interesting seeing the public response to these portraits. Some people really love them, some people were not crazy about them, but in my view, that's part of what art is supposed to do. Because, again, I mean, again, and I'm saying this as somebody who five years ago was saying I didn't want to be a political artist, right? Um, but you can't really understand art, I feel, if you remove it from its political, historical, cultural context. Um, and even when you, uh, even art that is escapist, or that is not overtly political is still political. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Bruno Mars, uh, when he made his Grammy acceptance speech for 24 Karat, he said that um, his goal with this album, he just wanted to make something that would let people dance, right? Kind of like disco. You know, it kind of reminded me of, of what people said about um, disco. He just wanted to make something that made people feel good, made them have a good time. And he really kind of placed it within the context of everything that's going on now. It's not just that he wanted people to dance and feel good and have a good time, but to do those things in spite of all of the circumstances that are um, around them. Of course, this was no artist without its controversy, of course. Um, this album and his win has also been surrounded um, somewhat by controversy. He beat out um, other black artists in the category who made more overtly um, political albums. Um, but again, my point is that it, it still can't be removed from its context. And many of the people who talk about loving this album, that's exactly what they say. It's like, I love to move to it. It gave me, you know, it gave me good hits for the summer, right? Um, Afrofuturism is also interesting. It, it's really, re I wouldn't say re-emerging, because it has been around for, for quite a time as a movement, but it's kind of moving more into the mainstream consciousness, particularly with Black Panther. They've got a reference to Black Panther up there in the top, if you can see. Um, Janelle Monet, of course, is one of the more recent um, adherents and advocates. Um, Missy Elliott, this over here is Soon Ra. He's a, a jazz musician. Then you've got Buster Rhymes over there, Erica Badu up there. These are some of the most uh, more recent iterations of it. But Afrofuturism is really about imagining um, blackness, not even necessarily only in future context, but really kind of imagining it in, in other contexts in ways that allow us to um, explore what it means to be black um, interacting with the um, oppression that we have experienced, but not necessarily limited by it, right? Um, so imagining black in a future world, which itself is a radical and um, political idea when you are living in a white supremacist world. It is a radical thing to imagine a black identity that is free from oppression or imagine a black identity that is uh, forward-looking forward and, and, and kind of future-focused. Um, in terms of the purpose of it all, right, I think it's important to recognize that art is innate to human expression. Um, you know, obviously this is a school that is dedicated to really honing your, your skills as an artist to really turn it into a, a, a profession. Um, but I think that sometimes we limit the definition of what art is. We limit the scope of, of what it means and what its purpose is. The fact is that we are all artists and creative in, in some kind of way. Like that's a that's a central part of what makes us um, human beings and what get, what gives us humanity. 
<clears throat> I think that because we live in a society that really focuses so much on how you commodify everything and what is the immediate dollar value of everything, um, if there's something that's not immediately profitable, people tend to devalue it. And so there is unfortunately a great deal of um, devaluing of the art as a profession and that impacts the, how, the extent to which we value art in education. Um, we see a lot of efforts to defund um, arts programs in schools, um, and that, that's really unfortunate because how do we grapple with, how do we understand um, who we are, our place and time, how do we communicate with each other about that, how do we share ideas but through creativity and art? Um, and there are a lot of people who don't identify themselves as artists but are nonetheless creatives. Um, but are, are, are nonetheless applying a certain art to what it is um, that they are doing. I am personally, um, really right now, now that I have overcome my uh, false notion that I could be an apolitical artist, I am really interested in exploring now how we use art particularly as a method of public education in a public space, um, in a moment, uh, just recently, I was invited to participate in a symposium at Monticello, that is the plantation that was owned by Thomas Jefferson. And um, they're continuing to do a lot of research and exploration there around what the life was like for, what life was like for the enslaved in Monticello. And so they held a day-long symposium to talk about this. What is the legacy of slavery? What does it, at Monticello, what does it mean for America today? And so as a part of that, in addition to um, participating on the panel, I created a performance piece specifically uh, for this event. I wrote a song, um, this is video, uh, these are images of um, the rehearsal. I uh, contacted a dance troupe and collaborated with them. And we did a, a whole performance piece that was specifically about that time and that place and that space. Here we are sitting on the plantation that belonged to one of the founding fathers, the one who said, all men are created equal yet enslaved his own children. And so how do we use art in a moment like that to, to bring people together and to create a deeper understanding in a, in a way that simple conversation can. And I think, again, that is uh, part of the enduring power and purpose of art. Um, I still personally am, am on a journey in terms of understanding what my voice is, what my lens is, what my platform is, um, how I use all of these things. And um, I got a great question earlier uh, in the documentary class, uh, particularly about that thing. Someone was saying, well, you know, how do you, how do you kind of weigh all of these different things? Um, how do you decide whether to be more political with something if it might you know, alienate people from you? Like maybe you, you lose some of your funding, maybe you can't get certain um, positions. These are all things that we, that we have to weigh. And my honest answer um, to that student, and this, the same thing that I would leave to you, is that that's what you have to figure out for yourself. What is the lens through which you operate? And I don't simply mean the physical lens, as in the lens of the camera, or the lens of your eye, though that influences it, right? But what is the consciousness and the awareness that you are applying to your lens, whether it's physical, whether it's your eye, the perspective that you are giving to your art. Intuition is a very important part of the creative process. And I think you should trust your intuition. I think you should trust what comes from your gut as you are creating. Um, but at the same time, as soon as you create, you wanna go back and look at it. You wanna develop a deeper consciousness around why you're making the decisions that you are. What is, the pers what is the specific perspective that is unique to you that you are bringing to your work as an artist? Because that's what's going to help you really hone your craft to find your unique voice and then decide who you want to be as an artist in this world. Um, I think the experience of art exists in three parts. There's the artist, there's the art that is created, and then there's the audience. And all of those things give life to it. There's what you put into it as an artist, what you intend for it to be. There's the art that exists beyond you, hopefully. If you make really great art, it will extend beyond your life and beyond your time. And then there's how the audience takes it and what, and what they bring to it. Um, and you want to create with all of those things in mind. But ultimately, it's up to you. And recognize, please recognize, and this is the last thing I leave you with, which I came into recognizing in some ways by happenstance um, 
Art is so uniquely powerful. It's so uniquely powerful. And so whether you decide that you want to do the kind of art that just allows people to dance and escape from everything, whether you decide you want to do the kind of art that is overt, that really forces the issue in people's face, really forces them to look at things that they were trying to look away from, the power that you have as an artist lies in your awareness of what it is that you are doing. Thank you. civil rights and that it has, it has always um, been that way um, you know some people talk about the violence of today but really I mean the, this movement of the 60s was much more violent you know compared to today there are a lot of people being assassinated you know we just recently had these bombings in Austin but there was a time when Birmingham was called Bombingham because that's how often bombs were being set off by um, white supremacists so I think I have a I have I have a healthy level of you know awareness but at the same time, you know, I, I just come back to a, a point. I can't, I can't allow fear to to dictate my life because to me, operating or, or living with fear is also kind of like a slow form of death, you know. Um, and so I, you know, I, I try to be aware of my surroundings, but also try not to let fear dissuade me. Any other questions? First of all, thank you for being here, and I'm happy that you're still here, and doing the work that you're doing. Uh, what you mentioned when coming up with the action that you did down in South Carolina, it basically seemed to me that you guys were, had like a think tank before you um, uh, planned the action. Would you say the design thinking is, has a key role Yes, I, I would say so. Um, the question was, um, he was saying that there was clearly like a lot of design and plan that went into this action and is that prominent in um, actions today? I would say yes it is. Um, one of my critiques of some of our modern movement, though, including things that I have participated in, is that um, particularly things like this voting rights sit-in that I did or some of these early sit-ins that we were doing, a lot of those things we were, um, they're trying to deliberately mirror actions that we saw from the civil rights movement to draw a clear kind of parallel, right? Because people are familiar with the highlight reel from the civil rights movement. And so for us to do similar actions was to kind of draw that direct historical through line. In terms of, str of strategy, though, sit-ins today are not the same as they were in the 60s. So first of all, in the 60s, like the lunch counter sit-ins and things like that, that was a very radical thing. Nobody had seen that at the time. That was part of why it was so um, groundbreaking. But it was also a direct civil disobedience action to uh, against what was being protested, right? You're saying we can't sit at the lunch counter and we're gonna sit at the lunch counter until you arrest us. Um, using the example of the sit-in that we did at the speaker's office, we weren't protesting the right to sit in the speaker's office, right? So that's a little bit more of like trying to draw a connection between the action and what, what we are doing, or the action and what we are, are protesting. I think that the most effective um, civil disobedience actions are the ones that protest the very thing. And that's part of, I think, why the Confederate flag action was impactful was because the issue centered on taking the flag down. You know, so we, it wasn't like we went down there and we just like linked arms around, you know, the pole and refused, you know, and, and refused to move. We actually took the thing down. That's kind of like a more direct, um, you, you know, attacking. Um, there have, I, I think that part of the struggle with civil disobedience today is that some of the issues that we are dealing with are a bit more nuanced. I think that the, the fight against segregation lended itself 
to um, that type of civil disobedience uh, in some ways a little bit more, just because just it was a little, it was a bit of a clearer through line. You're saying people can't be here, they're there, and then you're, you know, sticking dogs and hoses on them. It's just like such a clear, you know, moral um, through point. Today, you know, when people do things like blocking traffic, they're doing that be to bring things to a standstill because otherwise the 24-hour news cycle would just roll over everything that's happening. At the same time, it takes more effort to draw the direct connection between why are we blocking, you know, how is blocking traffic connected to um, a police killing, right? Because the very the thing that we're protesting is not the right to block traffic. We're blocking traffic to, to cause a disruption. So I think, I think yes, there's strategy, but it's a little bit more nuanced and some of it's a little bit more complicated. Yes. Yes, I would say so. I think that my background in media and communications and art definitely happened, uh, definitely helps because so much of, and I, I actually forgot to mention this, I meant to talk on that uh, earlier. So much of um, the media and communication day is image. And it's all happening so fast. There's so many things happening. It's a 24 hour news cycle. This thing is a trending topic, then it's onto that thing, then it's this, you know, then it's this other thing. Um, a lot of things are communicated through memes, 10 second videos, you know, very short attention span type things. And so in that kind of um, situation, you really have to be very deliberate in, uh, you know, how, how are, how are you um, communicating? How are you using traditional news media and social media and, you know, and, and all of these things to communicate what it is that you are, are trying to communicate? People don't even read essays a whole lot now. That's a, a, a large part of why I use um, threads on Twitter sometimes um, to communicate things because like threading on Twitter has almost become its own form of communicating with people who are used to communicating with text messages now. Like if you can't get it out in 140 characters, people don't have time for you. You know, so how do you, um, you know, how do you use your skill as a communicator in that kind of landscape? Do you know if there is, or are you part of any kind of a network, formal or informal, of artists like yourself who have become aware of and are, you know, the whole art and politics? So I, you know, years ago there were networks that were all over and, and joining together in different ways. And I'm wondering what's going on in that arena now. If you could point us in some directions of where to watch. Yes, I would say so. Um, there's a lot of great stuff coming out of Oakland right now, actually, I would say. Uh, still some good stuff coming out of New York. We're trying to get more things happening in North Carolina. Um, I think one of the things that we probably struggle with today that helped foster such environments more in the past is that we're more transient today. Um, our generation is moving around a lot more, and I think that um, in the past, the, the reason you were able to get things like a black arts movement was because people were geographically around each other. Um, they were kind of like concentrated in, in, in pockets more together. Uh, but most of the, I would say, a, a, I would say the majority of activists that I have been involved with are artists. Um, and we aren't always uh, consciously marrying the two. I know that that is something that I am becoming more conscious of. I, I have definitely seen others um, before me make that more conscious pivot um, to really using their art more um, impactfully. So like, you know, there was just a period of time, I think there were many people like me in 2013, it was, we were just in the streets. We were in the streets protesting because people were dying and it just seemed like society was just rolling forward like nobody was paying attention um, to what was happening. And so we were just kind of dropping everything and we were literally in the streets. And then I think we reached a point where it was hard to sustain being in the street all the time. You had some people um, who were probably already more kind of like minded towards politics are now focusing more on you know politics, electoral politics, shifting things in that way. I think those of us who were already artists and that was kind of our discipline, we're looking more about, okay, now how do we use our discipline with everything that we have learned and experienced um, uh, to, to be more effective um, in that way in terms of, you know, still pressing the point, still, still um, not only just raising the alarm around what is wrong, but also really trying to help imagine what is, what can be new or better? I think that's part of why um, a film like Black Panther has had the impact that it that it did was because of just this idea of Wakanda, the idea of a nation that had not yet been colonized. Um, you know, we start to ask ourselves, well, okay, 
all these things that we're protesting, white supremacy, racism, sexism, what's on the other side of that? Like we know what we're against, but then what's on the other side of that? And how do we begin the process of imagining that? You know, um, a lot of things begin as ideas and art before they are fully realized. And so I kind of feel like that's part of what our calling should be in this moment. When does it become escapism? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think it's a fine line, and I I don't think that escapism is always even necessarily avoidance, if I might say that right. So I think that there is a function. I, I think particularly when you look at Black art, like Black American art, and how it is often functioned, I think that there is a function of art that is about resilience. And, um, and black joy and you know sustainability. And so like when I would see a lot of the people who were kind of defending Bruno Mars or kind of like defending the album or talking about the value, the value of the album to them, those are often the terms that they would speak in, which is like, you know, I'm out here dealing with oppression all the time. I need joy sometimes, you know, and, and it serves a function in that way. It's not, it's not simply um, trying to uh, take my mind away from oppression so as to completely ignore it, but just to give me the kind of escape that I need to sustain sustain myself, you know, and, and to endure. Um, and so I think there's a long history of black art in particular kind of um, uh, serving that, that function. In terms of where that line really falls, that can kind of think it can kind of depend, right? I don't I don't know that there's a that there's a clear fine line. Um, in terms of like the Bruno Mars example, I use that because he defined it that way himself. You know, and I don't know that that I, I don't know that if every art that I might label as escapist, the artists themselves would maybe intended in that way or, or defined it in that way. Um, and then in terms of, like would you say like the commodification, is that kind of how you're, in terms of like Black Panther, like? I want to put a, one more twist to the first Yeah. Question. So as far as the artist, if the artist um, is painting about injustice, but not, let's say they, let's say they make a struggle for portraits about a police murder, but they're not actually marching the streets and not calling representatives or not proposing anything, does that become the state of the artist? I would argue no. I don't, I don't think so. So one of the arguments that I would make is that there are multiple lanes, like imagine there are a 10 lane highway all going in the same direction, right? There are multiple lanes for multiple cars going in the same direction. I don't believe that everybody has to do all the same thing to, to qualify. And I actually push back against people who say that they are, or that it's not activism if you're not being arrested. It's not activism if you're, you know, if, if it doesn't, if you're not getting tear gas, if it doesn't look in this one specific way. And I would really challenge that because that, that's just not the reality of how it looks. First of all, as an activist, as somebody who has been tear gassed, as somebody who has been arrested, I don't need everybody to do what I, what I do. I need activist lawyers. I need activist social workers. I need activist teachers. I need activist artists. I need, as an artist, I need activists within the industry who are making way for me to be able to make my art. You know, and so I appreciate um, those artists who are who are maybe doing that full time and maybe don't have time to do these other things. And there's also artists where um, they, you know, create that kind of art, but then they support causes in other ways. Now, if it's a case where the they are kind of like pulling an aesthetic. Right, or because it's trendy, you know, it, it, black freedom movement is trendy now, and they're just pulling an aesthetic to sell T-shirts, but there's no other connection outside of that. That's problematic. That becomes a little bit problematic for me, but that's just kind of how I look at it. Okay. Yes. Sorry, the last part was uh, we were talking about provocation uh, uh, and the political messaging. So I mean, Afro punk brings up comes to my mind because it started this DIY, mm -hmm. it's a system thing, and now it's gone pretty mainstream to turn on some people, but it's kind of this whole kind of this cool cultural. Mm -hmm. I think about the Black Panther, um, there's a quote, there's a criticism that, you know, it is genius because it's hot to sell black pride to black people now, and it was a great money decision. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, how do you, I mean, yes, it was positive, these things are positive, I love the concept of the movie, but there are, there are all these, these, these critiques that are valid, so how do we counter that? 
I mean, I think both of those things can be true at the same time. I have a critique of a lot of things. I can give a critique of myself, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I really can. I can give an objective critique of myself. Um, but I think both of those things can be true at the same time. It can be true that it is trendy and acceptable enough in the culture that the film came along at a certain point in the, zeit in the cultural zeitgeist that made it um, a hit. Um, it can also be true that it is still very powerful in terms of its representation. I mean, I think that film is going to have impact on uh, children for years and years to come. You know what I mean? Like, we're, it, it might be 20 years from now, some great artist emerges, oh, I remember when I saw Black Panther when I was eight, and that's what inspired me that I could be an artist. You know what I mean? I, I do think that it has that level of power just because of the, the representation. Um, and you know, a lot of, much of the controversy um, around art or surrounding the politics of art is really about representation and access, um, funding and financing, and uh, freedom of speech and censorship. You know, and so I think that the Black Panther film really falls into the power of representation. I mean, people are talking about just how powerful it was to see more than one dark-skinned woman on screen with natural hair and with speaking lines and multiple scenes, you know, and, and so even like regardless of whatever other critiques there might be of the film, you know, that uh, that, that was powerful. There's always good and the bad. I'm sorry, I hear somebody answer the question, but I can't see. Are you back here? Oh. I'm sorry? How does the statement of being political become an art form? How does the statement of being political become an art form? Again, I believe it's about consciousness and awareness, right? Um, so part of what took Part of what took the Confederate flag removal from um, a simple political demonstration or civil disobedience into performance art was the consciousness that informed it. And just like the level of, so like I had actually planned to do the, to scale the pole in silence. That was my original plan. Um, I ended up praying out loud, just trying to stay, you know, focused. I'm really trying to keep my spirit calm. I ended up, you know, talking to the officers, trying to, to keep them calm. But all of that ended up being part of what the audience saw, like those who were who were viewing the, you know, viewing the action. That ended up being a part of um, of everything that they saw, and so that that went into all of um, all of the meaning of it. Um, but even when I was quoting the scripture, I was able to to quote that because I had been meditating it on it. Um, in the lead up to the time that I that I took the flag down. So again, I think, you know, had I not put any of that thought into it, it could have just simply been a thing where like, okay, somebody, you know, scaled to the top, whoever, it doesn't matter. You know, we had three people who could have put themselves in the position to scale to the top and get arrested. The decision for it to be me was because we recognized how powerful, in part because we recognized how powerful the image of a black woman taking it down would be. And I mean, it was really from that point forward that we went from, you know, just a simple political act of taking the flag down to really creating um, a, a, a performance piece in some ways, you know, or, or really just taking a, a certain level of performance to it. Um, and I'll just say this last thing. Um, there's often overlap between um, political demonstration and, and performance. And, and some of the most um, powerful uh, political demonstrations have an aspect of performance to it. Um, the decision to, I mean, Ro Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat that day, but a lot of the messaging around Rosa Parks was capitalizing on the fact of, of how she looked and who she was. And it's like, oh my gosh, the system is so brutal, you know, to this, um, to this seamstress who is, you know, just, doing a hard day, hard day's work and you know I mean but they were they were conscious of of all of that and in terms of um, just the level of, a certain level of theatricality and, and performance that goes into um, really moving people I think
Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, shout out Ohio Student Association. I marched with uh, Ohio Student, Student Association um, in the protest for John Crawford. Really cool people. Um, and good job at plugging, giving people an actionable item before you sit down. That's what a good organizer always does. Um, creativity. I don't know how else to put it. And, and, I, and I say that at, um, acknowledging that this is something that I'm trying to figure out for myself as well. So I'll just give you an example of the situation that I'm in right now. I'm really trying to help the community in Charlotte organize around housing justice and fair housing. Part of the challenge that we're facing right now is that our city is booming like a lot of cities around the nation and it's leading to an affordable housing crisis. Um, our city's a large transplant city. It, it's rare to bump into somebody who was born and raised in Charlotte. And part of the issue that that creates is that people don't necessarily have a sense of the history. So as, as you know, communities are being displaced, people don't you know, necessarily have an appreciation, understanding for what was there before. Part of what I'm trying to, under, trying to figure out right now is how, do, how can we use public art in a way that can educate the community, that we can create a shared narrative around who we have been as a city and who we want to be as a city. Right? Um, and, and two, I don't think that you should always think necessarily in terms of protest and civil disobedience. It may not be that, right? Like it may not be direct confrontation action. It may be some other kind of dramatization um, or act, but that, that nonetheless helps raise awareness and helps um, advance the agenda. And then <clears throat> regardless, whatever you're doing, I would always have clipboards, <laughs> always have a, yeah, exactly like you're doing, always have um, some kind of, uh, you know, a, a follow-up action to go uh, along with it. But I think, again, Creativity, um, you have to think outside of the box, you have to think multimedia, and you have to think about meeting people where they're at. You can't, the people who you need to reach, you can't um, expect them to come to you. That's one of the other issues that we're dealing with in Charlotte. Our city is so segregated racially and economically, you can live in one part of the city and not have to interact with the other side at all. So I can't wait for those folks <laughs> to come over to where I'm at. I've got to think creatively about how we reach them and help them understand. Yeah, absolutely. Is that it? Last okay, last question. Ooh, okay. Um, as you, you said many times that at one point in your life you saw yourself as an artist who could be apolitical or that art could be apolitical, and you moved away from that through experience. What is your thoughts, generally speaking, on kind of the ecosystem of those artists who still feel that they can be or their art can be apolitical and they create, but that art that gets put kind of on a chessboard with other art that is sometimes blatant? I don't know. So <clears throat> in in these more re there was a really interesting point in time, I feel kind of at the like in the early stages of the Trayvon Martin case, where it still was it wasn't hip yet for like mainstream or well known artists or artists who might have something to risk. Um, in terms of being more overtly uh, political, I feel like there was a certain point in time where they were still shying away from it, and it was kind of more a void for independent artists to fill. In terms of the landscape, I'll be honest with you, I, I feel like oftentimes part of why you see the artists who are more overtly political uh, being independent artists is because, <laughs> because that's one of the ways that you stay free to do what it is um, that you want to do. I think that the more you try to move within the, within the industry, whatever industry it is, if it's an industry, um, you know, capitalization of whatever kind of art, commodification of whatever kind of art, um, you are going to encounter another type of politic that is going to push you more towards doing the apolitical um, type of art. And so I think that in, in, in terms of like navigating the landscape as an artist, that's something that you that you have to decide. I'm not willing to take $10 million uh, to tell to perform whatever somebody else tells me to perform. That's not me. That may be some other uh, some other folks, you know. Um, and and I don't necessarily I don't necessarily knock people for that. I don't think I don't think everybody has the same calling. I don't think everybody has the same you know um, um, artistic discipline or, or anything like that. But part of what I find that's interesting that's happening now in contrast to kind of like those early stages of the Trayvon Martin protests is that now it's become more hip. And so it's, it's really fascinating to me to watch how the current social movements have impacted advertising because they're going to find a way, whatever is like the zeitgeist, ad companies are going to find a way to take that and sell something to you. So like if you'll like pay, pay attention to the commercials that are happening now, all the commercials show people of different races and they're like skipping holding hands through a field, and it's like, we can all buy Chevrolet, you know? Um, and so, but, but I think that that's a constant. I think that that is a constant 
in human society as an artist, and it's something that you have to navigate, like weighing um, your your personal integrity against your ability, your, your need to survive. And it's like what I told the students earlier. Those are I cannot tell you how to make that. I can't tell you how to make that judgment. I can't tell you how to feed yourself versus uh, you know how you create your art. And that's why I really don't try to judge artists on that. But it, it's something that you have to navigate, and it's just the reality. You know, it's the, it's the reality. Um, that's part of why I, you know, when I kind of reached that crossroads point where I was saying I, I didn't want to be an apolitical artist, but I was certain that I didn't want to go into advertising just because I, to me, um, art and creativity is a part of how I breathe. You know what I mean? It, like, it's, it's that integral um, to my being. I can't simply create for monetary gain. That doesn't, that doesn't feed me or satisfy. I'd rather get a job doing something else and then just do art on the side. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.